Th thanks for coming to this second Advantech virtual update. Um, just for the people that are watching, I'm going to introduce everyone, uh, you know, if, especially if you're seeing this for the first time. This is only our second video. Uh, we've got Selesh, who is our account manager for New South Wales ACT and also Tasmania. We've got Philip, who is our uh, internal sales manager for Victoria. And then we've also got Jacob McChrystal, who is our sales manager for Queensland, Northern Territory, South Australia, and also Western Australia. So, uh, you know, Jacob's pretty big on things. He pretty much looks after uh, half the country almost single-handedly. We've got a few things that we're going to cover today. We're going to be looking at what we're seeing in the market. Um, yeah, today being the 27th of October, uh, things are looking at some quite big changes across the country, hopefully. Uh, we're going to be talking about an upcoming conference, uh, a new product release, uh, some stock changes, especially in the Melbourne uh, warehouse, and also we're going to be looking at some frequently asked questions from the market. So um, just to sort of get on with what we're all seeing, um, Philip, I just want to um, introduce uh, you know, yourself. Uh, what is it that you've actually been seeing out of Victoria over the last um, you know, few weeks? Thank you, Richard. Because of the prolonged lockdown and Daniel Andrews government's lower than expected easing up the restrictions in Victoria, it has caused a adverse impact on the market in general. That having been said, we still have business consistently flowing in, but the pace is a bit slower than normal. As the demand is there and now the government has announced stages of opening up more business, so I'm sure the market activity will be picking up along the way for the rest of the year. Yeah, there's there's definitely um, you know, a, a lot of things happening right now and es especially after what happened on Sunday and then I think I, yeah, for me, uh, what we found out yesterday was probably a little bit uh, unexpected. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see, especially over the next few days, what the immediate change is going to be. But um, look, Victoria, um, yeah, I, I think we're going to be seeing some yeah, I interesting times, uh, hopefully for the better. Uh, Selesh, let, let us know what's uh, going on in, in New South Wales. Hey Richard, market is doing well right now and we are getting a lot of inquiries not only from NSW but also from Tasmania and Canberra. So these which are coming from our existing customers as well as from channel partners but we are also getting the inquiries from our new customers which is a very good sign. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as Tasmania and Canberra is concerned, uh, these tastes were consistent, but now we could see new demand coming up and I'm really optimistic that going forward we would see new and big projects, which I'm, I'm hoping for these things here. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. No, it, it's really good to hear that um, you know, New South Wales is you know, seeing some signs of strength. Um, <laughs> So it's it's really, really good news to actually sort of get that feedback from you, uh, you know, considering that you deal with those customers and especially, most importantly, the new customers that you're seeing as well. Um, Jacob, I know that you look after, you know, the better part of half the country almost on your own. Uh, yeah, what are the trends that you're seeing? Yeah, um, luckily that the rest of the country, the rest of the nation hasn't really been affected by COVID, which is pretty good. Um, as badly. But yeah, the market's, the market's been very strong. Um, so quite a lot of areas now are actually starting to fully reopen. I know that WA is about to enter the phase five, which means that a lot of businesses are fully going back to operations. Um, so in the market trend, I'm actually seeing a lot of people get into IoT gateway stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So that increases our wise um, 4.4 series. Um, and also a few other companies are starting to more interact with the SIs and actually starting to fully go through there, which is really great to see because it means that, you know, we continue our relationship with our system integrators throughout the nation, which is great. Excellent, excellent stuff, especially with the, the, the strength of the integrators um, you know, coming through. So, um, team, thanks a lot for your feedback. Um, it's it's really, really good to you know, be able to capture what you're seeing directly from the market and you know, make that available to other people out there. So the next thing that we're going to be looking at is that we've actually got a um, upcoming uh, what we call the Advantech Intercontinental Partner Conference. Now that's going to be running over, um, at the moment it's scheduled for around about six days. Um, 
over the period of the 23rd through to the 25th of November. Now, just before that starts getting questions and comments about how it doesn't make sense, um, over the first three days, that's where really all of the actual conference material is going to be delivered, uh, with the second three days basically being all about one-on-one -on -one sessions and networking amongst uh, product managers and other companies. So at the moment, what we've currently got right now on the schedule is on the 23rd of November, which we think is the Monday, I think it's the Monday, um, we're going to be looking at basically the opening sessions. Tuesday and Wednesday are going to be to do with keynote um, you know, topic speeches, as well as two and three uh, workshops amongst different product uh, groups as they happen. There's going to be a lot more detail about that coming out, so hopefully we'll be able to get that through to you, um, you know, over the next few weeks as well. Um, so that's the upcoming, that's the upcoming press uh, partner conference that's going to be happening in November. Um, as per what we did last time, we want to introduce a new product to you. Now, the product that we're going to be looking at this time around is going to be the FPM 200 series screens. Um, there should be a, we'll make sure that there is a data sheet link uh, in the comment section of this video. Uh, but looking through the FPM 200 series, uh, we're not going to put it on screen for you right now, but Selesh, uh, yeah, what stands out about this screen to you? Hey Richard, there's a FPM 200 series which has been recently introduced in our offering. It mm -hmm. comes with a lot of features and I would like to highlight a few of them here like uh, these units are IP66 rated which means they are protected from dust and water mm -hmm. and uh, it also comes with three video ports namely HDMI, VGA and DP and the third thing which I would like to mention here is that these units can be panel mounted and also they have desktop and visa mounting option. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah awesome now they're, they're really really good points Slash. so um Philip, I'm, I'm going to ask you next. You're you're muted, mate. So um, I'll ask you to unmute yourself. What, what what's your feedback about what makes the FPM 200 series um, stand out to you? Yeah, I think the outstanding feature for FPM 200 series is their premium performance at affordable pricing. The mm -hmm. reason that we could achieve this is through global marketing strategic efforts and also the simple principle of increasing quantity to reduce mm -hmm. cost in production. As a result, we have a shorter lead time of two weeks, which mm -hmm. is much better than normal. And they also um, ideal for, I, for diverse IoT applications that could be deployed across different market segments, such as uh, manufacturing, retail and logistics logistic uh, environments, etc. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, no, that's there. There's, there's some really, really good points there, especially when it comes to that price competitiveness. Um, yeah, that we're seeing um, in this range of screens. Um, Jacob, I know that I know that your last cab off the rank this time again. Uh, what you know, what makes these uh, appeal to you? Well, the one thing that's really interesting about the new FPM series is that they actually come in 12 volt, um, purely 12 yep. volt uh, DC. So generally what happens is for a lot of FPM units, we come through 12 to 24 or purely 24. Um, so this is our first time that we're actually fully invested into 12 volt BDC um, because I feel like this is a very important thing to note because the only 12 volt uh, VDCs that we actually have are IDS models, which mm. actually aren't IP rated. So generally a lot of yeah. projects we might get is that they might require 12 volt, but sadly we can't supply them the IP rating. So it's really great to see that Avantech is actually starting to branch out into other sectors, just so that we can always make sure we have multiple mm. options for customers going forward. And I think that's you know going to be the the main selling point um, for this product. Yeah, the the exactly what you say about the twelve volt and the fact that it can actually appeal to more markets. Um, not to mention the you know the three different types of connectivity you know for your signals and your mounting options. Uh, and then when we also look at the price, uh, these are. Yeah, I, I think it really, really high value screens. So uh, I'm, I'm expecting to see yeah you know, these fill a lot of uh, yeah tick the boxes for a lot of customers moving forward. So this is going to be really, really um interesting. Uh, yeah, especially moving forward. Um, I was going to talk about stock changes. Um, now, as time goes on, 
Yeah, there's different products that we do hold here in Melbourne. Um, there have been some stock uh, changes as the market evolves and moves. One of the things that we are going to be seeing is we're going to be seeing the removal of the Uno 2483, uh, which is a fanless embedded box, Core i7, uh, yeah, fourth generation runs Windows 10. Uh, was also marginally capable of running XP as well as predominantly Windows 7 operating systems. That Uno 2483 is no longer going to be safety stocked in Melbourne. It is going to be getting replaced. Uh, I've just seen confirmation today that we are going to be replacing that with equivalent of the Uno 2484 which is the seventh generation i7 and mostly running Windows 10 cap capable. That being said, the 2483 is still going to be available. We're just not going to be holding it in Melbourne. So now that we've gotten all of the stock stuff out of the way, all of the hardware, all of the traditional things that Advantec is known for, uh, it's we want to look at answering some questions from the market. Now, it's been a fair while since we've done this, and there's actually been a lot of um, you know, emerging and you know, retrending questions that have been coming from our customers. So, Philip, I know that you've got a question that um, I think you want to ask Jacob. So uh, go ahead and ask that to Jacob. Yep. And some of my customers still want uh, Windows SP uh, with compatible old systems, Jacob. Uh, what can we still support and what is the supportable? Yes, so generally what happens is with a lot of our Windows XP models is that we actually have a very small amount of Win units that can still support Windows XP. Quite a lot of these will actually come in the Arc series and maybe one or two of the UNO products. Um, the only real models in the motherboards is one of our um, ASMB boards. So generally what's happening is because since Windows XP can handle third generation CPUs, we're actually phasing those products out very soon. So generally what we're is suggesting to or I'm suggesting to a lot of my customers is, is that they actually either go the Windows 10 option and downgrade to XP, which is what can happen with a lot of six and seventh gen models, or just accept the fact that sadly, you know, Windows XP is about 15, 18 years old now, and that it's solely time to start, mm. you know, pressing for Windows 7 or Windows 10. Um, but you know, it, it just depends on circumstances because some software that customers have still rely on XP. But at least we still have maybe three or four options for them. So it's generally just something that I could just send you through some data sheets of some models if you like. Yep, no, I, I think that's actually really, really well said there, Jacob. Um, unfortunately, XP, as good as it was, um, you know, it is starting to run out of time and you know, we do have to all move forward. Um, that being said, I do have, uh, I have noticed a question that's come up a lot, uh, especially in the online chat. So, Selesh, um, this is this is one that probably uh, yeah I, I want you to sort of be able to answer for us is that there's been questions regarding the security uh, features that can run on the Atom range, particularly the Atom six thousands. Uh, can you tell us about the different types of security measures that the Atom six thousand range have got? Yeah, sure. See, there are three layers of security protection that can be used in our Atom modules, especially Atom 6000 modules. And these informations are already available in a utility section as well as in, in the user manual of these units. So the first protection layer is password authentication. So in order to gain access to an Atom unit, you're going to be looking at password authentication so that you have password for programs, strategies, and all of your software in order to, for the access to configuration and password on the unit. Mm -hmm. Second thing, second thing, what you can do is you can restrict. In utility, you can restrict access to a specific module up to eight IP addresses. That means if the information is going to specific places, then you can restrict the restrict whether the information can actually be accessed from and then lay that up with password. And the last one is that if you are a type of a person who is really, really security sensitive and want to do a lot more and you need more than a simple password, more than IP bit restriction, then you need to look up network specific security like firewall, firewall protection. So these, these three layers of protections are there. No, th thanks very much for, for clearing that one up there. It's, um, it, it's, it's really, really good to know that you know, the modules themselves have got individual password restriction and access. Um, 
they've got the means to restrict what is accessible and where the traffic goes. Um, but then, you know, for anything more complex and broader, it has to go, the security needs to go that next level up. So thanks a lot for that one, Slash. We do have one last question here uh, that's that's been trending from Jacob's side of things. It's it's yeah. Windows related. Um, you want to ask that one to Philip? Yeah, I got a question last night. Um, I actually didn't have enough time this morning to check it, so I thought I'll just ask you guys a question. Um, a lot of customers have been asking me about the Windows 7 stuff, and I just want to know about the security side of things because I know that with what happened previously with you know the Vista and Windows 8 side of things, that there was actually a bit of you know problems with the security updates. Um, back then, so does anyone know if that's still going to be the same? I think Philips are general Windows guys, so what do you think? Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Microsoft has ended support for Windows 7 as of on 14th of January this year. However, Windows 7 license is still available, and currently we have three offers to our customers. The first offer is to purchase Microsoft ESU which is extended security updates subscriptions. It includes security update for three years after the end of support of Windows 7, and the ESU is offered per device as an annual purchase. It provides critical security update for Windows 7, but it doesn't include any new features customer requested long security update and design changes. And the second offer is to purchase McAfee or Acronis products to fill the security gap uh, caused by the Windows end of support. The last offer is to upgrade to Windows 10. Thanks, thanks, uh, man. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much. So, th so thanks for that. Um... Thanks for that answer there, Philip. Uh, I don't think there's any other questions, um, at, at least none that we were planning for. So look, what I want to do is, you know, we're, I think we're probably around about 15 minutes in, which is exactly the amount of time that we want to you know, be using here to cover all of these topics. Um, what I want to do is I want to say thanks very much to Jacob, to Philip, to Slash, um, and to you know, everyone else that's also involved in you know, helping put this together. Um, Thanks very much for your input. Thanks very much for your, um, your time and also your insight. If there's any questions from anyone out there, uh, by all means, please send them through via email. Um, the, info, the email there is info at advantech.net.au and just use the top, just use the words virtual update in the subject line and we'll have a look at um, you know, not only providing you the answers, but also looking at factoring in that for the next video. Uh, what, as always, more than anything, we really hope that this was helpful and we'll hopefully have an update for you soon. So thanks for your time and we will see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.